So it is 7.33 p.m. It is Thursday, November 11th, 2021. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Handler. Here. Kevin Mills. Present. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Um, on behalf of the town, uh, Kelly Lenema is here. 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 Have you with us? And uh, joining us our con as consultant, uh, is Paul Haverty. Good to have you as well, Paul. Good evening, Mr. Chair. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020, executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and continue allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may re meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video webinar via the Zoom app with online and telephone access is listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted, and the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. <clears throat> We'll move to item two on our agenda this evening, which is a continuation of the discussion of the, of the proposed decision for Thorndike Place. So turning to the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place, at its October 20th, 2021 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place. That vote took place after midnight, so it actually occurred on October 21st, 2021. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render a decision. On October 28, 2021, the board initiated its deliberations. They were continued on November 3rd, and we continue them again this evening. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, the town, or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting is being conducted using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. And on behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding. The board will resume its discussion using the draft decision available on tonight's agenda and can be differentiated by the text in the footer, noting an 11.03.21 revision date. The board will briefly review the revisions proposed at the previous meeting, then resume discussion with section H of the conditions discussing proposed revisions. At the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. <clears throat> Under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by November 30th or request an extension from the applicant to further continue its deliberations. Um, <clears throat> so bef before we start this evening, um, I would just like to um, uh, mention for the, for the board, but more specifically for those uh, who are watching and um, for other members of town. Um, so the, because the public hearing is closed, the board is unable to accept new testimony in regards to um, this application. And the board has received um, several emails from a variety of sources um, with comments in regards to this application. I apologize, the board has to ignore those. Um, they cannot be issued into the record as the record officially closed on October 21st. Um, and so I just want, so those of you who have uh, sent things, I, I want you to know that the board is unable to, uh, to accept those and unable to review them. <clears throat> so with that, um, do we want to discuss schedule first or do we want to just get into the conditions? Mr. Chair, I'd, uh, I'd suggest we do schedule first it seems quick and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Comparatively. 
Comparatively, <laughs> yes. And easy, yes. Okay. So we have a scheduled uh, meeting to continue deliberations on Tuesday the 16th at 7.30 p.m. Um, and we don't have a, a meeting scheduled beyond that. Um, and I, my, my sense is that we are not going to be in a position to, we're, we're definitely not going to be in a position to vote on a final decision this evening. Um, and I would be uh, cautious and even thinking that we might be able to vote for something on the 16th. So we also have a meeting scheduled for the 23rd, but it's already a pretty full night. And Mr. Haverty is not available on the 23rd. Um, so we have a couple of options on how to proceed here. Um, <clears throat> I would recommend, um, I, I don't think people would want to meet on Wednesday the 24th being the night before Thanksgiving. So uh, Mr. Haverty is available on Monday the 22nd. I know that means we would be meeting back to back on the 22nd and the 23rd. Um, and the 23rd is four new cases that we have not heard. But if people are comfortable with that, I think we should um, put in our calendars to meet on the 22nd in the evening. Does that date work for people? It doesn't work for me, I'm sorry. It does not work for Aaron, okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Does the, is the 24th a better option or is that really just not a great night? Roger, is that a can't make it? You're on mute, sorry. I'm I'm going out of state for Thanksgiving. I just don't know what time I'm leaving. Okay. So, but if other people are gonna commit to it, then I'll I'll do the same. I'll figure it out. Okay. But I prefer to do that as a last resort. Yeah. <laughs> Frankly. No, absolutely. You know, Christian, if I may. Yep. Uh, last time we met, I you know, I know that uh, Mr. Haverty is not available on the 18th. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I didn't know, I presume again, that we're going to be uh, in the findings at that point. And, and I didn't know if there were enough findings that we could just go through and say, you know, check, these are not controversial. We don't have any questions about them. And then you know, set aside the ones that we do have questions about for when we again meet and Paul is available. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how people feel about that, but I know we're in a bit of a crunch. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be, so if we could find a date to do a final meeting with Paul, then that would be by recommendation as well, is that we block out the 18th, knowing that Mr. Haverty is unavailable that evening, um, so that we could have that for further deliberation and make sure that we have things in the format that were that are acceptable to us and then we schedule one final meeting to um review the decision one last time and to to take a final vote what is the date we need to close this by that's we get closed by the 30th so we in theory we can go as as late as the 30th the my concern there is that it's that if we don't issue a decision on the 30th, then we are, you know, unfortunately we are statutorily in violation of the, of the law, um, which puts us in a very bad position. So we need to make absolutely sure that we are closed before then. If we had to meet on Monday, the 29th, I think um, that would give us a, you know, a little bit of, extra protection in terms of dates, just in case something happened. Um, but I know when we had discussed previous extensions with the applicant, we had said we would very much try to be done before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Well, Chairman, question, I'm, I mean, I'm a minor player into this, mm -hmm. I'm a, but my suggestion might not be to try to cram it all in before Thanksgiving, but the 29th, and if you have to do the 30th back to back, but my schedule, uh, schedules are what they are. Right, right. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Pat. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that if we do what Mr. DuPont has suggested, 
and to have a meeting on the 18th that necessarily presupposes there's some other meeting that has to happen on a different day that we can take those things which require Paul's assistance and have an opportunity to do them. Um, it's also true that if we are able to get through uh, with the facts and uh, and have reviewed the whole the whole business, uh, there may be. I mean, we would be a, if a final discussion. This won't be like the eleven sixty five case, and a final discussion is not going to take ten minutes at the end of perfecting the draft. Um, so both those things make me think that. If we do do something on the 18th, we have to squeeze in at least a short meeting after that in order to finish up. Um, I think it's really a bad idea to schedule anything on the 30th, since the application will be automatically granted if we have a hurricane that day and we're unable to meet or some other thing happens. We can't get a quorum. There's, there's any number of things that we really don't want to have happen. Um, we could conceivably set this up for the 18th and then take a nice vacation and then come back on the 29th on what we hope, what I hope would be a meeting that would be an hour or so and, and, just, and finally dispose of the case. Um, and so that would, that would make some sense if that accommodates people's schedules and trying to push it before mm -hmm. Thanksgiving does not. Well, let's go back to the 29th. If I'm 30 minutes late to the meeting on the 29th, is that a problem? Uh, not the 29th, I'm sorry, the, the Monday the 22nd, just to help spread it out for everybody. But we could also schedule to start at eight, if that's... I would recommend that, Mr. Chairman, rather than presume somebody's going to be late. I can commit to that, you know, it, okay. it helps, helps everybody here. I just have a, a late meeting. Yeah, no, no. So would that work for everyone if we mm -hmm. put on our calendars both uh, Thursday the 18th and knowing that we would be meeting on the 18th without, uh, without Paul's assistance and then uh, meeting again on the 22nd at 8 p.m.? Knowing that then, unfortunately, we're also meeting the 23rd at 7.30. Right. All right. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put those on our calendar so that Thursday the 18th at 7.30 and Monday the 22nd at 8.00. Appreciate, appreciate everyone's flexibility in, in fitting those in. Okay. So this is the draft decision that we have um, that's posted on the website which is the November 3rd version. Um, <clears throat> I have been using, in past meetings, I've used the, the sort of the personal uh, Word version that I ha I've been keeping that has a couple of extra, um, it just it has my notes in it. So uh, would people, but it's in Word so I can sort of edit things on the fly. Would people, is there any objection to switching over to my word copy? No objection. Please do. Here. Do that then. <clears throat> so we started last time. So I just want to go back. So last time we started with C2. Um, so there are still a couple of things, a couple of questions we'd had on earlier ones that we need to uh, tidy up. <clears throat> but we'll get to those. So uh, C2 um, is for items that were gonna happen prior to the issuance of building permits. Um, 
so we had had some questions on G and I had gone back and looked at what we had done. So there's a question on G because it says we have to pull the building permit before we pull the building permit. Um, and what we had done at 1165R is we had just added a second sentence, which said it's understood compliance with this requirement is part of the building permit process rather than required prior to the issuance of a building permit. So I think that if we adopt that language, that'll resolve that issue. Else, that was it for C. Uh, to, if anyone has any questions or comments in reviewing the the, dra the draft from that was issued after the last meeting, um, speak up as I fly through here. Uh, D on project design and construction. Uh, I talked about construction plans, kind of management. Uh, we had talked about adding pest control to this line. Can we can we go back? Yep. I'm looking at C two L. L. Yep. And I, I just I want to take the chance to to go and double check what the applicant's offer was with regards to putting the money in the escrow account. Okay. And and compare. I I think that that is separate from issues having to do with um, the phase one. So I just want to make sure we're not conflating those two issues. Okay. And then in M, it talks about phase one assessment to indicate the possible presence of oil or other hazardous waste. Okay. Um, right, which is the appropriate. But I think there was somewhere else where it said hazardous materials. I gotta go back and find what that was. But I just want to make sure we're being consistent with the language of the statute. It's actually not in this. Materials is the proper term? No. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. It's oil or hazardous materials, not hazardous waste. Okay. So just want to make sure we're correct about that. So D, prior commencement of the work, construction management plan, um, properties inspections, obtaining walls, confirming the conditions of the existing sewer line, conforming to all local, state, and federal laws. Not waived. Um, and then we had in our discussion um, about the about driving piles. Um, Mr. Ford had uh, made a recommendation for a change, which he emailed to me. So that is shown here. Um, so the applicant shall prepare a pre-construction survey of the adjacent houses and shall utilize geotechnological engineer to perform daily vibration monitoring with seismographs during ground improvement construction to limit peak particle velocity, i.e. vibration level, adjacent to the above grade build, existing buildings to frequencies that reduce the probability of structural damage to generally acceptable levels and specified by a geotechnical engineer. Do we have any questions on that language? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Yeah, it was specified by the geotechnical engineer. Has this geotechnical engineer been specified previously that the applicant's going to hire one? Yes. Uh, the, uh, part of the project, there will be a geotechnical engineer hired by the owner for the building foundation. And that would be the geotechnical engineer that would... Um, be able to uh, specify the these the survey and the, the monitoring. So geotechnical engineers, after they do the record, so geotechnical engineers generally provide the recommendations for the foundations for the building. So they're the ones that tell the, the design team and the owner, we suggest using ground improvement to do, the, the, to sit this building on to limit settlement. So they're very familiar with with the, the uh, foundation work and the ground improvement. So they're often required to write spe um, specifications 
that uh, provide the guidelines for different testing and inspection things throughout the project. You know, they 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 tell contractor how to um, prepare the subgrade. They're so they're knowledgeable, and they're also the ones that can that can provide this testing and monitoring to make sure the adjacent residence foundations aren't aren't um, undermined. So this is really about protecting the neighbors using um, using testing and monitoring techniques to keep the vibration levels below. So imagine if you go out there and they start um, doing this um, uh, ground improvement and ground improvement, all that is, is they're compacting the soil with kind of a, a big hammer, an anvil. And so they, they, would, they would sit there and use equipment to monitor the site while the contractor's placing it. And so the contractor would have a sub that's actually building it. And if the vibration levels get too big, they would be able to to notify the contractor right then if the vibration levels get too high. So that that's the kind of the intent of what this this would do to help protect the neighbors. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I really like the addition of this language. Uh, my only um, my only suggestion might be in the uh, next to last line where this has been added, where it says, uh, that reduce the probability of structural damage. Uh, you might want to just say to the adjacent houses because you said that up, up top. You know, survey of adjacent houses, and I thought probability of structural damage to the adjacent houses. It's probably understood, but I don't think it hurts to put it there. Okay. It would reduce the probability of structural damage to the adjacent houses at the generally acceptable level. Okay. Uh, Steve Revelock, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, this is a small nit, but levels and specified. Um, is the word and necessary there? Looks good to me. That sounds right. Okay. All right, so we'll move on, 58. So we have about temporary signage, uh, lighting, utilities. Um, we decided to table the conversation about the hours of construction um, activities. So that is something we will still need to come back to. Uh, hey, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Yes, I went through my notes to see if I could find discussion of Saturday hours, and I was not able to find, um, you know, I didn't write anything down about that. Oh, okay. All right. So, but we, Mr. We had, Chairman, to, to the extent that there is some sort of relief granted from the, the hours in the bylaws, we just need to make sure we have a corresponding waiver grant. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I do remember that in the discussion in the public hearing that there were several people who commented on Saturdays and um, I failed to go back and look at the video so that I can't really pinpoint it, but I'm pretty sure that it's there. Um, the so I, as I understand it, really, there are a couple of questions here. One is the question whether changing the hours here involves something that is purports to vary a bylaw. Uh, and if so, we need a waiver. But in any event, we need to know what we're doing. Uh, but that, in turn, uh, also has to take into consideration that the bylaw involved in, in, involves uh, a noise situation. And the applicant had been offering it that if they could bring their people on board, they wouldn't have to begin making any noise until after the time specified in the bylaw. 
So that's one set of issues. The second set of issues is to the degree to which any of this, uh, what actually is beneficial to the community. And there it was not, it was pretty clear to me that people wanted Sundays and holidays. And I think probably if they could get Saturdays too, uh, they would prefer to do that. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me though, what the overall balance is. And I think that, that I at least am gonna to have to go back and review, um, review the videos in order to get more of a sense of what the neighborhood thinks it's, is best for its own peace and security. Uh, I don't really think that, you know, that I have a, a clear sense of that as of now. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. No. Uh, myself, and I think Mr. Ford referred to this earlier, that possibly curtailing the hours on Saturday afternoons uh, would be preferred. I think um, even though if the noise ordinance says it's permitted till 5 p.m. on Saturdays, given the special nature of this construction project being embedded deeply in um, a neighborhood setting uh, and children would like to enjoy the streets on a Saturday afternoon, I would feel comfortable limiting construction hours to 1 p.m. on Saturdays. It'd be my vote. Yes, but um, I. the question is, is would this be a, a unique condition placed upon a, a 4DB project that's not routinely placed upon other projects that aren't done, you know, through the through the normal channels? Mm -hmm. So I, I if if we could find an example of one that might be useful, but I'm not aware of any. Agreed to Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I've been viewing this largely and I mean, when we had the discussion, there was a certain sense of a quid pro quo that the applicant was prepared to, to consent to reasonable limitations on its, on construction on Saturdays, Sundays and holidays in return for an adjustment to, um, an adjustment to their starting and closing times that would enable them to use the time more efficiently. Uh, and certainly we have the authority, I think, to impose conditions that the applicant has consented to, but we do need to pay some attention to the degree to which the applicant has consented to them. And I'm not 100% sure where that, where that comes out. Uh, it wasn't as if we actually negotiated it to a finally, okay, we'll do this and then you'll do that. Uh, we have to sort of deal with a more ambiguous, uh, a more ambiguous record. Um, so it, it's a consideration, but I think that in the absence of, of uh, some reasonably reliable indication of consent on the part of the, of the applicant, we're quite limited in what we would be able to do uh, just because it's a good idea. And unfortunately, if they, you know, the construction of the duplexes if they were just done on their own separately, you know, it would be like any other residential construction in that neighborhood. It would still be able to be conducted seven days a week. Um, so we do need to be sort of cognizant of that as well. All right, so we'll come back to D16. Uh, D21. Um, so there's a question about snow and snow storage. This is that snow may not be placed into a resource area, um, but there are situations where there is snow that's being removed from within a resource area that can be left in a resource area. And the language that was proposed by the Conservation Commission is under condition I-5. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm recommending that we Note that snow within resource area may be relocated per the requirements of condition I-5. And we'll come back to that when we get down there. Mr. Chairman, on D-22? D-22, yes. Um, the sentence, the applicant shall also implement, implement all necessary controls to ensure that vibration from construction activities does not constitute a nuisance or hazard beyond the property. Is that already covered in D-8? Uh, D-8 
Yeet, you definitely got it pretty deeply into yeah. vibration. It seems a little redundant. Yep. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And the rest of this deals with noise, which is a separate issue. Perfect. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. My pleasure. Three. The D24. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of remaining question about what happened, you know, damage that happens um, to neighboring streets because of construction activities um, and damage to street trees, damage to curbs, et cetera. So those are, they're under Title Three, Article Four, damage to, way, damage to ways, liability bond in the town bylaws. Um, there was not a request made to waive that provision, I don't believe, by the applicant. And so that would still be um, in effect, which is basically allows the town, um, if it is, has concerns about you know, holding on to funds uh, from the applicant to cover potential damage uh, that the town can do so. And then so where this, where Title Three, Article Four has not been waived or not been requested to be waived, um, it would still apply. And then D31 was um, additional because it, the request for D24 included both the streets and the trees. Um, so D24, this just deals with the street and then D31 uh, was trying to come up with a way to address the question that was left last time about trees. Um, the applicant shall, will survey existing street trees along the proposed access routes the site with the tree warden to develop a plan for minimizing impacts to street trees in the neighborhood. Any damage to street trees shall be reported to the tree warden. And hopefully that will um, basically allow the, the applicant and the tree warden to come to an agreement as to what the current condition of the trees are and how to avoid damaging them during construction and then anything that happens that does end up damaging a tree, it's the responsibility of the applicant to report that to the tree warden. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. So what is the underlying law? Suppose the applicant does damage street trees, uh, which I take it in this case means trees within the right of way. Is that what, what makes it a street tree? That is correct. It's trees, the trees that are within the right of way that are the property of the town. Um, and Mr. Moore has told us often enough that that there's a via, that that destroying a street tree is a violation of state law. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to figure out what the what the underlying rule of law is and what the applicant's res responsibility is under that. Um, if we knew we could cite it in more or less the same way that we did in the preceding in the preceding one, just to make it clear. Uh, I, I wouldn't want it thought that the only thing that the applicant ever had to do was if he made a mistake to say, I cannot tell a lie, Mr. Tree Warden, I destroyed that tree. Um, you'd want more to happen and presumably the law already requires more to happen. So it would be nice to be able to say that any damage to the street tree would be subject to whatever the underlying law is. And I don't, I don't know what it is. I can look that up, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that, Mr. Haberty. Thank you. We're on section E, construction completion, certificate of occupancy. Um, This is what we had been working on the last time. Um, it was just having the, the fire department sign off on the emergency access driver on the senior living building. 
Um, and then I had gone back through <clears throat> the, memor the, the draft memorandum of understanding um, between the town and the applicant and realized that there was a portion of it missing, um, which was the, the question about um, uh, setting a conservation restriction on the portion of the property listed as the potential conservation parcel. Uh, we had addressed all the financial concerns that were um, potential for the MOU, but we had not addressed the conservation restriction question. Um, and so that's what this language is here. Um, again, in the absence of a signed memorandum of understanding between the applicant and the town of Arlington regarding the final disposition of the conservation parcel, following the completion of any remediation identified by the chapter 21 E site assessments, the applicant shall enter into a conservation restriction under MGL chapter 184, sections 31 through 33, for the portion of the site identified as the conservation parcel on the plan in, entitled potential conservation parcel dated August 27th, 2021. Such CR shall be in effect in perpetuity and shall limit the use of said parcel to conservation of the wetland resources and passive recreation by the general public. So I think that sort of gets at what we were hoping the, the final disposition of that property would be. And again, this, um, you know, should an a memorandum of understanding be enacted between the applicant and the town, this condition would not be in effect. All right, it's just a final certificate of occupancy. Submitting final documentation, the residential building, uh, the residential business, the property management. Uh, we moved on to traffic, traffic safety conditions and sidewalks. Now about access the property, just using small non-articulated delivery vehicles, uh, complimentary jitney service. Uh, some emergency vehicles can adequately maneuver through the site, long-term bike spaces, short-term bike spaces, um, the information that would be in the transportation information packets, the number of parking spaces, there would be eight garage level handicap parking spaces, parking senior residents subject to an additional fee, Provide electric vehicle charging stations, parking for residents and staff. Uh, and then G, police fire emergency medical. Um, applicants should provide a professional senior housing operator, property manager, and maintenance personnel on the premises during typical business hours. Stairwells and garages, fire rated per state code. Fully sprinklered. Um, Elevators, fire access, exterior lighting, uh, access control, accessibility for the fire department, and again to consult with the fire department prior to the commencement of construction. So that is where we left off last time. Any further questions on those items? All right, seeing none, we will pick up tonight with section H. Um, uh, this is water, sewer, and utilities. The applicant is responsible for the design. Infrastructure is installed in conformance with the technical requirements from the town. Fire hydrant should be placed as shown on locations approved by the fire department. And Mr. Eight. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I was I have my own notes in another version. I just had a couple of questions. Please. Oh, but we lost you. You're on mute again. Um so in H Nope, oh, you're back on mute. I'm not sure what happened there. Am 
my my space bar isn't working for some reason. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess uh, on H1, I just wanted to make sure. So when you say responsible for design and installation of utilities, I'm assuming that it's the utilities as they're defined down in H6. Is that correct? Because I just want to make sure. When I read that to begin with, you know, I assumed I knew what utilities meant, but I just wanted to make sure that we're thinking the same thing that's stated in uh, H6. Is that correct? Um, so the definition of utilities there. Liquid water service lines have been used to serve one like. Yes, I would think that's correct. Okay. And um, I had a similar question, and I think, again, a lot of this is self-explanatory, but I just want to be sure. So where you say all water and sewer infrastructure, um, the same question is, what is the infrastructure that we're really referring to? Is that also clarified or defined somewhere? Um, I don't think we go specifically into it. Um, but you know, the, the water and sewer division is going to be approving the final plan for connections to the water and sewer. So, um, so the infrastructure like on the water service side would include um, check valves, would include the piping, would include service valves. That, that's fine. I just wanted to make yeah. sure that that's essentially understood. Yes. And then if I may, in H4, where it says uh, water service, does that include the sewer in this as well? No, so the water service is the incoming water service. Okay. Um, that's for now, that's what I was wondering. Thanks. Okay, absolutely. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, if I could suggest that <clears throat> it, it would be neater if the definition of what utilities are that are in, is it H4, H6? H6, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that's a definition that's going to be used in this entire subsection, it would probably be more orderly to make it appear in the first provision where it comes up. Since if there's any question about it, people tend not to look to later provisions for an interpretation of earlier ones. Mr. Haverty, do you see any issue with doing that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, so the recommendation was in section in paragraph H6, there's a basically a, a, um, a definition of utilities. The question was whether that should be relocated up to uh, paragraph one, which is the first time that we mentioned the word utilities. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it might be helpful to pre preface that by saying for purposes of this sub subdivision H or whatever, whatever level H is, mm -hmm. so that it's just clear that this definition applies to every provision in, in part H. In that respect, I guess we do need to do a, ch a check that I wouldn't suggest doing the second just to make sure that utilities doesn't appear somewhere else where we need this definition, because <laughs> uh, otherwise it might apply that this, de that this definition doesn't apply to that, and, and maybe it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it's very hard in a long document like this to get a common word like utilities defined in the right way everywhere without having a definition section at the beginning. Uh, certainly. Um, so omitting that from H6, then we're just left um, that the applicant does need to relocate a utility pool, and so they'll need to get a random location from the select board. Uh, 
EPCO responsible for trash recycling compost or yard waste removal from the senior residential building. Um, and then the, the applicant should provide a copy of the trash recycling policies and guidelines to all purchasers, the duplex units, which will be serviced by municipal trash recycling and yard waste collection. Fire hydrants on the property should remain private. <coughs> H9. So H9, this is the one where the, the there was a, a recommendation from the town to have the applicant design and provide a temporary wider sewer easement um, for the beyond the existing 10 foot easement during the period of construction. And the issue was that you know, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals is not a board of survey, so we cannot grant easements. Um, and there was some confusion about what exactly the town was requesting it for and what they were gonna use it for. Um, and so I was gonna recommend that instead we change it to the applicant shall allow access to the town to all easements during the period of construction and shall not unreasonably deny temporary access to property adjacent to the easement to provide suitable room to perform all necessary work within the easement. Mr. So, Chairman? Yes, sir. So as I was reading that in the condition that I find it prior to your recommendation, the question that I had was where it says to provide suitable room to perform all necessary work. Uh, my question was, it wasn't clear who was going to perform that work. And I think it's understood that it's the town, isn't is that, that correct? Is correct? Right. So in whatever way you sort of fashion the language, when you say, you know, to perform work, I think it's for the town to perform the work. So just so that it's clear. Um. Suitable room for the town to perform all necessary work within the easement. Okay. Right. And then under H9, so there was a before it had said that all sewer services should utilize an eight inch service line, but certainly the Duplexes are not going to receive an eight inch sewer line. The, the apartment building will receive an eight inch sewer line. So, um, just, and we had discussed in a prior hearing, um, and I believe it's on the drawings this way that the, it's an eight inch line for the senior residence building, and it's a six inch, is the typical service line for residential buildings, uh, for, du for you know, single units and duplexes. So, would change it to um, sewer service to the senior residence building should utilize an eight inch service line and shall discharge into a sewer manhole when entering the town sewer collection system. Sewer service to the duplex building should utilize a six inch service line and discharge into the street main or as directed by the water and sewer division. And that ought to address those issues because the duplexes will connect to the sewer line in a different fashion than a much larger structure would. Any further questions on the H's? Brings us into the I's. Uh, wetlands floodplain environmental conditions. Um, prior to commencement of site clearing preparation and construction, erosion control measures shall be installed consistent with the approved plans. The applicant will be required to obtain an order of conditions from the Arlington Conservation Commission or superseding order of conditions from the Department of Environmental Protection because the applicant proposes work within the 100 foot buffer zone to, to a bordering vegetated wetland. So this is just to confirm that the applicant is required to still abide by the state law uh, for wetlands conservation and needs to get an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. So Mr. Chairman, I think we should clarify in that condition that that um, order of conditions is pursuant to the Wetlands Protection Act. Order of conditions.
Good for that. Uh, three no uncovered stockpiling. Uh, I four no heavy equipment stored overnight. No refueling or maintenance machinery or vehicles within a hundred foot buffer zone. Um, I five there should be no dumping of woody vegetation leaves grass clippers brush into the wetlands resource area. Um, foregoing does not apply to clean snow removed from the emergency access road as long as no sand or non-approved deicing materials are used and the snow is clear of all foreign debris. Um, an alternative de-icing product such as magnesium chloride may be used as recommended by the winter parking lot and sidewalk maintenance manual published by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, so this was recommended by the um, Conservation Commission in their, in their most recent letter before the, um, before the closure of the public hearing. I wasn't sure if we should put the, include the website of the document in the decision or whether we should leave it out. Anybody feel strongly either way? No. I don't think it hurts to include it, Mr. Turner. Okay. Uh, my own personal preference would be to include it as a footnote, but that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it should be set off by something. I can't decide if it should be brackets or parentheses or, or uh, less than, greater than, or what? Um, how, how about just a comma after agency? All right. Done. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So um, if we could just look back at I-4 uh, again, mm -hmm. um, this may not be particularly or specifically relevant for this paragraph, but I've listened to Mr. Moore enough times at our meetings where I have this <laughs> sort of, uh, I have this sort of script playing in my head, and this is a compliment to him, about, you know, the, the areas around trees that need to be considered in terms of making sure that their root systems are not damaged. Mm -hmm. So I know that there is a reference in C.1D, uh, point small Roman numeral six, to there having a tree protection plan. And I'm just wondering if the tree protection plan would include the, these sorts of things that are mentioned in I-4, like no heavy equipment, you know, rolling over the ground next to you know trees and i don't know how to word it but that's what came to mm -hmm. mind was the idea of somehow making sure that heavy equipment was not stored or driven in places that would pose a threat to trees that are in the tree protection plan and maybe the tree protection plan sort of subsumes all of this but i i'm not sure mr Chairman. i Oh, we have uh, Mr. Revelak and then Mr. Hanlon. So um, I thought the purpose of I-4 was to protect the, uh, the resource areas against potential fuel spills or hydraulic oil spills or that sort of thing. Um, I'd be mm -hmm. curious if anyone knows, but you know, I, I could be completely wrong about that. If I can interject, I think you're right about that. It was just that that's where it sort of popped into my mind as I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hanlon? Uh, no, just a minor thing. I, I did I did remember because I recently had occasion to look at it that Mr. Moore is always talking about protecting the critical root zone. That's kind of as the term of art for that area where the compression of the soil might damage the roots and destroy trees. It, 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 Mr. Revelak does seem right to me, though, that this is not really aimed primarily at that. So let's keep that in mind, and then we'll, if we come across the right place for it, we'll put it in. If not, we'll make a place for it. <laughs> Those I-4 and I-5, and, and I-5 is the section that we had referenced 
from a prior um, condition in regards to uh, relocation of snow within the resource areas. Um, so I6. Um, so this is again one where it, it sort of appears to similar languages in two different places. Um, so while no dewatering is anticipated by the applicant, any water discharge as part of any dewatering operation shall be conducted consistent with the requirements of condition I-40. Um, and well, because all of this is in I-40 along with some additional information as well. So we'll... Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So what is it that this condition actually adds? I mean, if we deleted it, what would we lose? Um, I don't think we would lose anything. Um, Can we say the condition is intentionally left blank? <laughs> just not, just not, right. just not to throw off the numbering. <laughs> but it's funny because that's sort of the, the thing that keeps ringing in, the, in my the back of my head. It's like if we get rid of these sections, we lose the numbering. Um, so for the moment, I'm just going to mark it in red. And, um, Boy, it's that sure will be impossible to overlook in the future. That's for sure. sure. <laughs> and when we get down to I-40, we'll we can confirm. Okay. Uh, seven applicants will hire qualified environmental monitor report to the board. So this is very consistent, it's very uh, similar to what we had done at 1165. And then I8, again, a little similar, but it's mostly involved with the creation of the. Um, Floodplain compensation area. Then I nine uh, works to be conducted in accordance with the approved erosion and sedimentation control plan. Um, we had gone back and forth at the last hearing um, whether it should be within one week of final grading or whether it should be a longer period of time. And our conversation with the conservation commission is they recommended leaving it at one week. Um, it's just too much can happen if you leave it for too long. Uh, I-10, it's about the uh, silt bag protection of catch basins. And that the, if necessary, that the bags can be removed to prevent localized flooding. But it has to be done in conjunction with the board and the DBW and the environmental monitor. Mr. Tr Mr. Chairman? Yeah. I don't remember using the word developer before. Ah. Yeah. Go back to applicant. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Mr. Mel. Going back up to I-8, there was a to be a report after a rain event. Yes. Do we specify how soon that report needs to be made? I mean, it's left open-ended, open it appears. We don't specifically indicate how soon it needs to be submitted. I mean, if you leave it open-ended, it could be anything. True. I'm not sure what an appropriate time period would be for such a report. Does um, Paul have any experience with these matters, Mr. Chair? Good question, Mr. Haverty. I, I do not have any experience in terms of what an appropriate time would be for a notification. I would think seven days, you know, would be sufficient. I mean, Mr. Chair, you know, in case something really did go sideways, we need to be aware of and remediation needs to be necessary. I think yeah. time would be an essence and 
seven days would be, you know, allow them a decent amount of time to make a response. Okay. No, that's a good observation. Thank you for that. This I eleven. Uh, there should be no sedimentation into wetlands or water bodies located on or off site from point of upward discharges. Um, so it just says that there shall be no sedimentation, but it does, we don't address what happens if it happens. Um, and I don't know if we specifically need to indicate what will happen. Good question. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I wonder if Mr. Haverty could advise us as to what our options are un, uh, under this. I mean, I, it, it's entirely possible, I would guess, that sedimentation for water bodies or wetlands located offsite in particular uh, might, might not immediately come to the attention of the applicant either. And I, it's this, the more you look at it, the more it sounds a little complex. And I'm sort of interested in what, uh, you know, how it is that this a condition of this kind can be enforced and by whom. Well, <clears throat> ultimately, every condition that's imposed by the board is enforceable by the zoning enforcement officer. Um, these are permit conditions. They're um, part of the comprehensive permit and the zoning enforcement officer in the first instance is the entity that would act uh, to enforce your decision. If there's an appeal or if there's any questions regarding you know, how it's applied, it would then come back to you. So in the draft version of the um, decision as marked up by the applicant um, from September 24, they, they made no comments in regards to this statement. Um, I, believe, I don't think Beta did either. Yeah, so neither, neither Beta nor the applicant had any comments in regards to this one, so perhaps we just leave this off. And, and I think if you look to a condition I-13, it really gets into what your remedies are. Okay. Um, which includes you know, money that you can use to conduct remediation work if the applicant doesn't act in a timely manner to do the remediation themselves. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. A uh, quick note, I think you've got developer in I-8 as well. I think it's the only other reference. At the very bottom, next to the last line. No. Developers, thank you. Okay. So I think we're okay, I eleven as it is. I twelve. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um so I'm still a little bit concerned with with I-11, just in that I'm not quite sure what the nature is, the, what the whole scope of the nature of the obligation is. If you look at I-13, it would be, I think that seems to rely on commencement of work within a resource area, mm -hmm. but I-11 doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I-11, and, and it doesn't actually depend upon any effect on this particular parcel or on any resource area at all. It's just sedimentation into wetlands or water bodies, whether they're located on or off the site, and whether it's from a point discharge or a non-point source discharge, which I assume means from the site, although it doesn't say that either. Um, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of this. 
Uh, and it may be just that the only things that we can enforce are the things in I-13. So we might as well just let this stay there. And if there's an enforcement problem, there is. But I feel slightly uncomfortable with a very broad obligation of that kind without, without any clear sense of what, of, of what becomes of either finding out that it has happened or if it, and if it has happened, finding out what the remediation uh, is required and, and, and what we could require. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that if this is talking about, you know, sedimentation in Alewife Brook, that we probably would have very limited authority to require them to do anything to remediate Alewife Brook, but, but I don't know that. It's, it's just very broad. Yeah, I mean, the, the language that's here was in prior to the last round of reviews by the applicant and the Conservation Commission yeah. and Beta Group, and none of them had a concern about this condition as written. Well, if they're happy with it, that's okay with me. Okay. Well, it's actually, could we go back to just uh, for context, condition I-1? So prior to the commencement of site clearing, preparation, and construction, erosion control measures shall be installed consistent with the approved plans. So the er, lack of erosion control will get you sedimentation discharges. And, so and if you look me, at I-13, it also addresses the erosion yeah. control. So I, I think that I-11 is just being, um, you know, it's, it's a broad it's a broad condition in the sense that I-1 is a broad condition, but I think the two are related. Mm -hmm. um, if someone were to report uh, a sediment discharge into a water body uh, to the zoning enforcement officer, the zoning enforcement officer could say, hey, that you are in violation of this condition of your, uh, your permit and you, know, you need to do the following to remediate. Um, I presume the, the zoning enforcement officer has the power to you know, request a specific remediation for a violation. I would think. So. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, if there was sedimentation, it would be a violation of the of, as you say, you know, violation of the of the permit of the comprehensive permit, and would have to be remediated. Um, I, Which may be as simple as you know repairing. You know, whatever failure of erosion control you know had occurred on the site. Right. Um, so I twelve um, board or its duly appointed agent, which may be the town conservation agent acting on behalf of the board, shall have the right to enter the property for inspections. And provide they'll have to provide reasonable access. Um, I thirteen prior to the commencement of work within any resource area, the applicant shall, in addition to any other security or surety required by this decision, provide the town security in the amount of ten thousand dollars via bond passbook, in order to provide security for the work and erosion control measures in or adjacent to resource areas. In the event that said work erosion control measures have been deemed to have failed. For our maintenance, the applicant shall be given written notice of such deficiency along with an opportunity to cure the same within 14 days. This was one that originally had said, I believe, seven days or longer. And we decided to just cap it at 15. Um, in the event the application, the applicant does not timely cure the deficiency, or if the applicant refuses to repair, replace, or maintain such erosion control measures in a timely manner upon written notification from the board or its agent, said security may be accessed by the board to pay for expenses for whoops, replacement, repair, or maintenance of erosion controls. That's just changing the structure of that sentence. And then to the extent the board is required to access and use the security, as a said, the applicant shall replenish said security and return it to $10,000. Uh, I-14, prior to work, um, the Army Corps of Engineers, if necessary, I don't, it's probably not necessary. I think, I can't remember if the Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction over floodways or not, but 
uh, just have it in there, but it's moot if it's not necessary. Uh, 15, prior to any work commencing aside, applicant should submit proof of a national pollution to discharge elimination system, construction general permit. I-16 is another plan requirement. I-17 um, shall sub the applicant shall submit details confirming the rooftop detention system. Uh, rooftop, let's say rooftop rainwater detention system. So it's not confused with any other detention system will conform to the runoff assumptions and calculations in the applicant stormwater analysis. Uh, stormwater, not rainwater. Any change to the, rooftop, to the rooftop detention system design will require the approval of the board. So this is one where the um, applicant had a question as to whether that final about that final line. Um, but I think it's important that if there are changes to that system that is reviewed by the board or its consultants. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. If, excuse me, if the issue is, I mean, maybe Mr. Haverty can comment on this, but if the if the applicant's objection was that that was somehow a later discretionary decision of some sort, um, it, it seems to me that what the underlying intent there is to make sure that it's understood that a change in design would be material and that the applicant would have to come back and, and obtain an amendment to the, to the permit to get approval for the changed design. At least that's, that's, that's the way I read that. Um, and if that's true, it doesn't. If that's the way, if that's what it means, it's not clear to me that there'd be any legal objection to to, to to making clear that a change in this design is 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 something that is a significant deviation from the final approved plans. And I wonder if Mr. Haverty can comment on whether that is that the way this actually works and is intended to work. So the board can't prejudge whether a proposed modification is substantial or insubstantial, but it's certainly within your rights to note that any change to the rooftop detention system will require the approval of the board, whether that's an approval through a determination that the change is insubstantial and thus automatically approved, or whether it's a, through the determination that the change is substantial requiring a duly noticed public hearing. But either way, the process you know, requires approval by the board. Okay. So Thank I don't you. see any, any problem. With that. Thank you. Okay. I-18. So this is one where there's a bunch of different notes and comments from different sources. This is all has to do um, with you know, the, the subgrade, water infil stormwater infiltration, and determination of the groundwater level. Um, and so this language here is primarily from data. This is partly partly beta and partly um, conservation commission. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, my, as a matter of policy, my in inclination is to follow the, I mean, especially on everything that has to do with wetlands, it's exceedingly important that the applicant be completely in, on, in sync with the recommendations of beta and the, and the conservation commission on here. Um, I'm wondering though, whether the language that, I mean, this is kind of hard for me to read, but it starts saying, if it is difficult to determine the seasonal high water, uh, groundwater elevation from the borings or test pits, 
and use the Frimpter method and so on, which doesn't sound like the language of a condition at this point. I, 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 my understanding is, is that I, I don't know exactly what it means to say if it is difficult to determine it, mm -hmm. um, but otherwise it seems to me the applicant shall be doing certain one thing or another rather than just use this method. Okay. Do we think that that it's clear enough to say, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what to do better and the hearing is closed, but I'm not quite sure if, if whether it, if it is difficult is something that has a meaning that's sufficiently, sufficiently definite to, um, to, to be enforced or to decide whether the Frimpter method needs to be used or not. And I'm going to check my notes, but, um, and I don't remember which comprehensive per, I, I, I recall there being an objection to the use of the Frimpter, to requiring the use of the Frimpter method. I don't recall if it was this comprehensive permit or another one. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. It was this one. It was uh, Ms. Chapnick, and she wrote a, a page explaining why it was the printer method was required. And may, okay, maybe this you. is one of those things that isn't, I mean, uh, in substance, I, th I think I understand what it is is intended there. And I would like to make sure that this language achieves what the intention of the Conservation Commission is. Um, but we may want to circle back on this with, from the point of view of drafting and just make sure it's it and compare it with what Ms. Chapnick said and uh, and make sure that what we have is is serviceable. And this is one of that um, the applicant had originally requested we strike and I believe the reasoning for that was condition C2K, which does call for um, uh, determination of the level. Let's flip to it on another screen here. So C2K, the applicant shall perform additional test fits at the proposed stormwater basins to confirm groundwater elevations during seasonal high water conditions as confirmed by monitoring nearby USGS wells. Test fits will be witnessed by the town and or agent. Should revisions to the infiltration system design be required based on additional groundwater investigations, revised plans of stormwater calcs will be provided to the Department of Planning and Community Development for review prior to the issuance of building permits. And so, this just provides additional information in regards to that. Well, that, Mr. Chairman, I mean, it seems to me that from a drafting point of view, that this makes things a little bit more difficult because this begins by saying notwithstanding the provisions of condition C2K. So you set that aside. And then I assume that the word thorough at the end of that sentence it was intended to be through. Um, and I guess I guess we need, I, I'm not sure we can just do this right the second, but I, I think that we need to look at C2K and this together and see how we can economically write something that 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 realizes the the intent here without getting into the confusion of apparently inconsistent provisions dealing with the same subject matter. All right. Um, I-19, 
So the site shall be graded to ensure no increase in peak runoff rate or volume is directed towards Dorothy Road, consistent with the analysis provided by the stormwater report. Um, there's a question as to whether we ought to keep this or remove it because it's basically just a condition that says that they need to do what they said they were going to do in regards to the runoff towards Dorothy Road. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I feel pretty strongly that we ought to keep it. Okay. The worst that could happen is that it's that it's duplicative, in which case, why does the applicant care? Yep. And it and I think it's worth sending a message clearly mm -hmm. to the community that what we're insisting on here is that the water doesn't go in their direction, or at least yep. for those living in that direction. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would point out that it can be difficult with all of the different documents that get submitted during the course of you know, a comprehensive permit proceeding mm -hmm. to really, you know, be able to, to put your finger on certain things at certain times. It's, it's helpful to have things spelled out directly in your decision, even if they're already reflected on plans or reports somewhere else. Okay. Well, thank you. That's helpful advice. So we'll definitely keep this. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah. is, um, do we want to limit this condition to only Dorothy Road or uh, should we, is it worth mentioning Little John as well? They do meet at the corner. Right. <laughs> so I could add it. I Twenty. A qualified professional engineer to oversee the installation of the stormwater system. I know what this is as well. Stormwater best management practices, uh, porous pavement, rain gardens, similar elements, and should it be within the property or throughout the property? Um, but throughout the property seemed a little more inclusive. I-21, applicant shall treat planted areas within resource areas and buffer zones only with slow release nitrogen fertilizer once during the initial planting year application of this fertilizer is not permitted. So we had originally said after, and during the last hearing, somebody had recommended that after was wrong, it should be before. Um, so we've got some people saying before and some people saying after. So in the absence of knowing which one in particular is the absolute correct one, I thought maybe we would just say within two days before and after just to cover all our bases. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. Fertilizer may only be applied twice per year, once in the spring and once in the fall with the exception of the initial planting year. This plant, this shall be, and then the Conservation Commission had requested, uh, this shall be a continuing condition in perpetuity that survives the expiration of the permit. And then I-22, application to plant nutrients shall comply with, with this section. No other herbicides or treatment methods may be utilized on the property unless approved as part of the approved invasive species management plan. No pesticides or rodenticides shall be used to treat pest management issues within resource areas. And again, it shall be a continuing condition in perpetuity. And then I-23 um, had originally said that the application of sand and salt within 100 feet of a resource area is prohibited. And this is just to change it, um, except to specifically noted condition I-5. So I-5 is the one that has the, 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 alternative, the alternatives, the reference to the alternative salt that is, a, is allowed within the recreation, excuse me, within the resource area. 
that. Um, so I-24 would be removed. So if we were interested in we're looking to put a new condition in. <laughs> So there's a question about protecting the critical root zone. <laughs> Wanted to put in here as a placeholder, but we may have another placeholder earlier too. Yeah, I believe it was I-9 or I-6 perhaps. <laughs> so that one will go away. And I, if we don't want to renumber, we can, I think, just indicate that this condition is omitted and move on. We want to maintain the numbering, or we can just condense the numbering. Um, I twenty five is cleaning catch basin sumps. Um, applicant to provide compensatory flood storage is indicated in condition C one. So I don't know if that again that's. That they so they'll do what they said they were going to do in another condition. I don't know if we need that one or not. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, this, this seems to me to, I mean, this is literally just saying that they'll, that the applicant will comply with another condition. I, I don't, it just seems to me we shouldn't do that. Okay. Not unless there's something here that's not meeting the eye. You can also get rid of it. I think there's, oh no, you can't, I'm sorry. Um, I-27. So, the, so this one here is the applicant. So it's again, a restoration plan for the compensatory flood storage area, which is, there is one reference to under condition C1. Um, so to some extent it is duplicative, but this does include the statement that, that the request of the conservation commission that maintenance shall be a continuing condition of perpetuity. So if we, I, I don't think there's any harm in keeping it. Mr. Chairman, the material that struck out, is, is there an explanation for that? So that's all included under C1. I see. Give me some um... Is there any reason why we don't just say maintenance of the compensatory flood? It, I take it there's a reason why you can't do that last sentence, put it on C1 and get rid of all this. Um, just looking at the language of the mitigation, the compensatory, this is restoration plan. If all we care about, it could be that we could just leave the sentence, that last sentence and get rid of all the rest. Right. Well, I possibly an, an answer, possibly an argument for leaving them. C1 is, you know, it starts with prior to the construction or site development activities, uh, the, et cetera, et cetera, the applicant shall. And there's you know, requirements to submit a bunch of plans. And I guess, yeah, so the, yeah, I guess this is effectively just saying, you know, the, you have to abide by the plan that you've submitted and it will, that, and that 
criteria will survive the the condition in perpetuity. I mean, I sort of understand why, but I defer to the um, you know, to the uh, to the to the attorneys in the group <laughs> as, as far as what's better. It's not, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. It's not completely clear to me that the plan will necessarily. I mean, just to get away from the language for a second, the plan is going to be what the plan is. It probably is not going to to extend all the way to the judgment day, and so it it will be what it is. I I think the intent here is to say that. It isn't the sentence doesn't say maintenance of the compensatory flood storage plan, but the restoration area shall be a continuing condition in perpetuity that survives this permit. And that may go beyond this actual scope of the plan under C1. I don't know whether that is possible or not. But the idea is supposed to be that once the permit expires, you still have got to maintain the compensatory flood storage areas. And if C1 doesn't clearly say that because it's all about putting in plans and you have to assume something, then maybe what this should be, maybe literally maintenance, there's nothing duplicative at all about, about that. That doesn't talk about that last sentence doesn't talk about plans. It just talks about maintaining a certain restoration area indefinitely. I mean, in some ways, the reference to the restoration plan seems to me to confuse the more than it it helps. I have the feeling that it's there to link us back to some other condition of the of the thing, but that ultimately what the purpose is is to make sure that nobody just abandons the restoration areas. Right, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So. I just on on another copy. I looked, uh, you know, did a word search for restoration plan. I think this is the only reference to restoration plan, and I may oh, really? be missing something. I don't know if it's in C one. So I mean, if this is a creating a separate uh, obligation for them to provide a restoration plan, and this is the only time that it appears then I think it's got to stay. It may be that it's indicated in C1, but it's just not called by the same name. At least in my Word document, when I looked up restoration. So there is a C1F is the compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. The three year vegetation monitoring schedule, a native non cultivar species to establish a diverse community, ground cover, native woody shrubs and trees, plants installed, maintained in accordance with the AAN. A monitoring report shall be submitted to the ZBA annually in June during the three year monitoring period. Uh, that's basically the extent of that. So if we are looking for a restoration plan, then this is the only place it's referenced then. And it should stay if in fact, that's what we're looking for. I mean, this is Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, it is in start instructive in that respect. The, the language that we struck out is what appears in the beginning of C1F. Yeah. 
which in C1F is designed to describe what goes into a compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm not positive here that, I mean, it, it is not unusual in, in, in this that similar plans go by slightly different names depending on how they got in here. Right. And I'm not sure that the intention is to have a separate plan from the one that's provided in C1. This, this goes in both in different directions. Um, and I wonder if, uh, I mean, I think Mr. DuPont, Mr. DuPont is right. If this is really intended to be a new plan that we need to keep this here or put it someplace else, it's not 100% clear to me. I mean, this is an odd time for, for having another provision for submitting plans. Right. Because certainly this, the items that are striked out are, are things that have already been included under C1F. Right. Um, but I'm wondering, but C1F is specifically that carries us up through the first three years and then it basically right. ends. So I'm wondering here if rather than referring to this as a restoration plan, because it's really not that doesn't really follow with the um with the maintenance in perpetuity mm -hmm. and what if we refer to this as a long-term management plan for the proposed compensatory flood storage area and then maintenance of the compensatory flood storage restoration area shall be a continuing condition i mean i 20 listening to listening to the to the discussion it sounds like yeah this this might actually be a a maintenance plan. Um, so if we wanted, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if we wanted to do that, is it is the right place to do that in I? I mean, generally speaking, we've all, when we've, We've, we've consolidated the mm -hmm. submission of plans at a particular point in the process. Right. And I don't know what point in the process I-27 would, 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 would be part of, except that it indicates in condition C1, which then carries you back to the mitigation plan. So if we think it's something completely different, that we need to have it still another plan on it for maintenance, mm -hmm. um, then I would think that we, we have to look and see whether we've deleted anything and see that we could stick this in. Um, but, you know, the, the I, you shouldn't have to look for throughout the whole, in order to find the submission requirements, you should be able to look at the part that has to do with submission requirements and not have them spread sort of at random through, through the, through the thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, could I-27 possibly, rather than, you know, uh, being a condition that requires a plan, being just a condition that requires maintenance? Uh, maintain the, in other words, maintain the thing that was required in C2, I believe, F or C. The applicant shall maintain the proposed compensatory flood storage area indicated in condition C1. Shall provide ongoing maintenance of. Mm -hmm. Cause, I mean, I, I think in the long term, what matters more is that the is that the maintenance is done rather than whether there's a specific plan for it. Right. So the applicant shall provide ongoing maintenance of the comp compensatory flood storage area required by condition C1 F. And then maintenance of the compensatory flood storage restoration area shall be a continuing condition in perpetuity that survives the expiration of the permit.
you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. That all sounds great to me. Um, I, I think we ought to note aside that once we get a final, once we get to the stage where we're reading through a final draft to make sure it all makes sense, we mm -hmm. ought to tick for ourselves that this is one of the position, one of the things we ought to look back at again and make sure that that we're happy with the way the way it all works. It, it seems like right now it seems like a great solution. But I think that we we would like to look at it with fresh eyes when we when we do our final review. Okay. Uh, I twenty eight is the invasive species management plan. Um, so that <coughs> invasive. Yeah, the Invasive Species Management Plan, I believe is C1G. Yes, so C1G is an Invasive Species Management Plan. Mr. Chairman, this this sounds a great deal like I twenty one twenty eight I twenty seven, but with a different subsection than C one. Right. With the twist that uh, C one G, um, you know, says that goes out go, goes ahead and says that invasive species management shall be a continuing condition in perpetuity that survives the expiration of the permit whereas the compensatory <laughs> flood <laughs> didn't <laughs> maybe that's just the solution altogether is to do that in 27 <laughs> yeah is to put 20 is to move that part of 27 up into c1f yeah, new Roman numeral. Okay. So it does appear that 28 in its entirety is now is duplicitous. Yeah, but it does seem that way. And I-29. All mitigation plantings, all plantings, resources shall be native and installed and maintained according to the standards of the American Association of Nurserymen. And then, in case they don't exist anymore, it's for whatever succeeds them. Um, by 30, all plant species planted, all plant species planted, invasive species removed through the project shall be monitored for three years. This is survival rate of 80% is the recommendation of the Conservation Commission. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, can we go back up to number 29, please? Yes, sir. Uh, line one shall be native non cultivars, please. Non cultivar species. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So Mr. Mills's question reminds me that this looks very familiar. And I wonder, I mean, to be sure that most of this is, came from the 1165 case, but I'm wondering if the substance of I-29 isn't already in something else that we've done within this case. It is in the compensatory flood storage mitigation plan. So this is sort of, this is for areas outside basically of that. This is for plantings in resource areas. Yeah. So I 30, I can't do that.
So where did I get that language from at the bottom of I-30? So this was in the October 14 letter from the Conservation Commission. Um, it says, add the following condition to this section consistent with the condition in 1165 R Mass Ave. Um, only quirk is that this specifically references a compensatory flood storage area. Whereas the top of the set does not necessarily. And then this comments here in the, to the this portion down here, starting with the applicant shall submit, that's from the Conservation Commission. And then the question that had come up during the hearing was whether there should be, this should be separate between the invasives and the plant restoration, whether it should be five years rather than three. And then the question about maintenance thereafter. So the question about maintenance thereafter was covered here by the Conservation Commission. years seems to be consistent throughout the documents. I'm reluctant to extend it to five years of monitoring. And I'm not sure there's an issue about planting restoration and invasives that matters. Also one, this is sort of one other nitpicky thing. Um, section C1D covers uh, planting of areas not under the jurisdiction of se Section 24 in the wetlands bylaw, so non-resource areas. And here we're just saying all plant species planted and invasive species removed through the project. We're not saying that it's, it is in section, in, you know, areas that are under the jurisdiction of section 24 it's we're creating an overlap mm. i think possibly and because and it it's all it may be relevant because the last paragraph in c1d um has different requirements for the types of planting that um like for example there's no mention of non cultivars yeah So, right, so the plantings, landscaping plan for areas not under the jurisdiction of section 24. So that is the, like the plantings around the buildings themselves. Mm -hmm. So in there, yeah, so we're there, we're allowing cultivars because it's, you know, up against the building kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then section E, subsection E is for Areas under the jurisdiction of Section Twenty Four. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Thank you for the. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. Um, <clears throat> existing species list, replacement species. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, in L30, the first line refers to uh, species removed through the uh, through the project. Mm -hmm. So it's referring to the whole project in general. And then the additional language at the bottom only refers to within the compensatory flood storage area. Right. Can we take compensatory flood storage area out and just say through the project? to be consistent with the first line? Mr. Chairman? Yeah? If we did that, 
then we I mean the first line is also shall be monitored for three years mm -hmm. and there won't be anyone after some period like that uh, who is responsible for monitoring and maintaining the planted vegetation. Not, not at least under that first sentence. We, as we see, we, there, there have been sentences that have just come up in whatever provision that, so maybe somewhere else that's there. But I don't see what the point of the last sentence is. At least the part about being in, in, in perpetuity with, if it's limited to a monitoring regime that lasts three years. Right. So in the applicant's markup, they had removed this portion here about the monitoring report. And they didn't have any of the stuff at the bottom. And the stuff at the bottom just comes in from the Conservation Commission. I mean, just to step back, Mr. Chairman, in terms of policy, it seems to me completely non-objectionable for us to be asking for them to keep us informed as to who the contact party is um, for as long as the obligation lasts. Um, there's no particular reason why we should know who any of those people were. And as a practical matter, I doubt anyone will tell us no matter what this says. Uh, you know, after you get past the point where you've got a monitoring regime. Uh, so it seems to me that the, it ought to be possible simply to say that the applicant shall submit the contact information of the party responsible for monitoring and maintaining. Um, well, that's an interesting question for the monitor report or something like that. But I guess the problem and that we should know if there if if that person changes, and it seems quite reasonable. But I don't know what exactly. I'm, what I'm wondering is whether or not the intention is that that this is glommed on to this particular paragraph when it ought to have been glommed on to some other paragraph, and we're missing it. Yeah, I'm wondering if this should been looking at how to incorporate this possibly into um, section C1E. Which talks about the um, vegetation under for areas that are under the jurisdiction section 24. Look at that some more. So I thirty one, I thirty two, I thirty three are all slightly similar. It has to do with work in the adjacency the resource areas. So if there's one, no work shall be allowed in or within 25 feet of any resource area except as shown on the approved plans. And that is beta's language. The first one, then the second one. I mean, no disturbance shall be allowed in or within 50 feet of any resource area except the shown on the approved plans. And then limited activity only is allowed between 50 feet and 75 feet of 20 resource area mitigation must be provided for any work between 50 feet and 100 feet of any resource area. Definitions of work disturbance limited activity mitigation shall be defined as defined in the Arlington regulations for wetlands protection. Now this is referencing the 2015. Are we okay with that or do we, do we need to say it's the earlier version? Mr. Havity, what do you think on that? Well, the, 
application was filed in 2016, correct? Oh, that's true. Okay, so the 2015 does still apply. Okay. Yep. Forgetting what year it is. And um, the the uh, page on the town website for this project also references the uh, regulations for wetland protection dated June 4th, 2015. Oh, perfect. Okay. Sections four and five. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I don't know that there's any reason to do this, but this I-33 does not report to be enforcing, at least I don't read it as in, enforcing uh, the Arlington, the regulations for the wetlands protection. Uh, you know, it just is, it, it, we could, it's a condition that has certain words in it and mm -hmm. we could ask those words to, for, to be in the Oxford English Dictionary from whatever year or in some code of federal regulations or whatever whether or not any of those things actually apply of their own force to the subject. I, I don't know if there's any particular reason why we would want to do that, but it doesn't seem to me that the general notion that they're not subject to anything other than, uh, the, than the 2015 version doesn't necessarily preclude us from... Sorry, that, that was a pill that I have to take in order to fall. To keep to keep going, um, so I don't I don't know if there's any reason. It seems to me this is just fine, but but I but we we it's, we don't have to do this. I don't think. I mean, I think it's here just because it <clears throat> limited activity is a defined term, so it's sort of just clarifying or reiterating the requirements of the regulations for wetland protection. Yeah. Applicants shall revise and provide to the board a long term pollution and prevention operations and maintenance plan to include requirements for inspection and cleaning of trench drains, the roof stormwater outlet to ensure these are functional prior to significant rate events, as well as maintenance and cleaning of the compensatory flood storage areas to ensure these remain functional and will provide anticipated flood storage. Thirty-five is essentially a duplicate of thirty-four. Go with that. Thirty-six. Um, so it's, it shouldn't be written as a finding. The applicant must provide adequate quantity of vegetation. I said vegetation shall be maintained to provide the resource area values protected by the bylaw. Further, the applicant shall submit an invasive species management plan for work in the aura as indicated in condition C1. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so, it seems to me that that the second sentence is is entirely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, the first sentence um, is vague, but I have this feeling that there may that there is a need that that's filling, and that I don't quite get what it is. Um, and I guess I'd like to sort of mark that. There may be others who who actually know what that is driving at. But the Conservation Commission also often in early on said the board finds that and then follows it, followed it with something that was an effective condition. Right. And here, I'm pretty sure that the Conservation Commission has in mind something, some place where they need to say that there has to be an adequate quantity of vegetation and that it be maintained to provide the resource areas protected by the bylaw. And I think we ought to spend some time hopefully not this very second, but sometime trying to figure out what it is that that actually was intended to relate to. Um, 
because it's possible that there's a hole there that needs to be plugged and and what we have in front of us doesn't make it easy it's easy to find it mm -hmm. it, it does seem more finding like than condition like right yeah it's, it said shall be maintained to provide the resource area values is what that's the condition part which they're already required to do. Yeah. I mean, if it's entirely duplicative, we shouldn't do it. Otherwise, you know, the debate we have now is going to come up later on when, when people scratch our, their heads and wonder what on earth we were ever up to. Um, so I don't think it's a good idea in general just to allow them duplication to happen there as long as we're sure it's duplication. Bit of a jump in numbering we're trying to fix. Um, so any building or safety watering operations? So this is one where I think I, we had an earlier one that referenced I 40, which is this one here, which is much more inclusive of what should happen for dewatering. Notification Conservation Commission, Department of Public Works, catch basin should be cleaned out, discharge part of the dewatering should pass through filters, measures should be taken to turn no erosion, discharges are to be set back at least 50 feet from veg bordering vegetative wetlands, and isolated vegetated, vegetated wetlands, Dewatering shall not take place in any manner that leads to water being discharged or allowed to flow onto property not under the control of the applicant without the express consent of that property owner. And that I-41 was one that had been recommended. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you wanna just put in written consent on that paragraph five? Forty one. There are some questions of, because we don't have full detailed information about how the rain gardens are supposed to operate. So there was a concern expressed uh, by the Mystic River Watershed Association and by Beta about do we need to include something that would help to ensure that they function? Um, but we don't have any real language for it. Um, and what we have here is seems rather aspirational and not really enforceable. I'm not certain how we can fix it. Mr. Chairman, if, if we were trying to give our an explanation for what we what we think we mean is will function as intended. Do we have any idea what that means? What is what is the purpose? Of, I mean, why is it that people are even talking about this? Right. I mean, I, there are a couple places where there are rain gardens, and the intention is that you know the water flows into the stormwater flows into the garden, is retained there, and then disperses more slowly. Um, but I think on the original. I, I think this came about because on the plan, the submitted plans, it was quite vague how these were to be constructed. And so I, there was some you know, concern that they would not, what do we do if they don't function as they're intended? Mr. Chairman, the rain gardens are part of the stormwater management system. They are. So I, I would just tie this to the DEP stormwater management policy. So to ensure the proposed rain gardens will function as intended pursuant to the DEP stormwater management policy. I 
That works. Um, Mr. Chair. Relax. Um, item five under I-40, the yeah. last sentence read, reads applicant without the or without the expressed written consent of the property owner should that be express that's a great question i'm not really sure i'll to turn to a lawyer on that one <laughs> <laughs> mr chairman uh, he's yes, right is, it certainly should be expressed yeah <laughs> all right like that yeah okay All right, so that is, is there anything else under this section, section I on wetlands, floodplain, and environmental conditions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to section J, other general conditions. Um, decision will be deemed to be final upon the expiration of the appeal period. I think this is all sort of boilerplate stuff. Applicants shall comply with all local regulations of the town and its boards, commissions, departments, unless specifically waived herein. Applicants shall copy the board on all correspondence between the applicant and any federal, state, or town official board or commission concerning the conditions set forth in this decision, including but not limited to all testing results, official filings, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the I think the applicant was concerned about that one initially. Nope. Nope. They weren't. Okay. Um, decision prohibits parking or storage of any unregistered vehicle on the site and likewise prohibits the service of any vehicles on the site except during construction. Overnight parking of vehicles on public ways is prohibited in the town of Arlington. In the event the applicant or management company fails to maintain the stormwater management system for the project in accordance with the operation within 14 days, so notification by the town, conduct emergency repairs, yada, yada, yada. Um, the project entrance way and interior roads and drainage systems associated therewith shall remain private and the town shall not have any legal responsibility for the operation of maintenance as such. The town shall also have no obligations relating to proposed recreational areas on the development parcel and the construction operation of which shall be the sole responsibility of the applicant. The applicant is required to maintain the sidewalk along Dorothy Road clear of snow and other obstructions per local ordinance. Um, notwithstanding the provision of the previous condition the town shall have no obligation relating to the construction and operation of the conservation parcel, except as mutually agreed in a separate memorandum of understanding. Step R. What did I do? I mangled that word. Step, uh, what did I do? Separate. Put an R in there. There we go. Um, then violation breach of the conditions by the applicant. It's general enforcement provisions. Mr. Chairman? Yep. Um, I'm wondering in NJ7 what we mean by the construction and operation of the con conservation parcel. I mean, I thought that it would be subject to a conservation restriction that would preclude construction. And I guess I'm, not, I'm a little worried about using language that implies that, that construction would be in the conservation parcel would be, would be permitted. And I guess I'm wondering what, what it is that, that that is intended to, to deal with. I mean, generally speaking, you don't construct conservation parks. Right. Yeah. It seems to me. Perhaps more yeah. restoration and maintenance rather than construction and an operation. Maybe that's right. 
Well, you could imagine constructing certain things on there. There might be a boardwalk, for example. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, oh, of course. Anything else in section J? All right, so this brings us, so that's the end of the conditions. Um, so there's still a number of conditions that we have sort of notes on that we wanna come back to. Um, I think we're all set on the waivers from before, and then we just need to move on to the, um, the findings themselves. So, um, it is quarter of 10. So we can do one of a number of things. We can vote to adjourn at this point and pick stuff up on the 16th. Um, we could start in on the findings. Um, but I was going to see if we, if there were specific conditions that we wanted specific people to look at between now and the next section, next session. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just as we get, as we get down to the end, I wanted to reiterate that I, I wanted a couple of minutes to, to, to explain oh, yes, the please. document I just circulated earlier and some things that I'm hoping to ha happen when we, when we get to the, the findings. Okay. Um, Maybe what I will do is um, when I go back through the work we've done tonight to update the draft um, ahead of it being reposted by uh, to the board's agenda for the 16th, um, I'll send a memo out to the board members um, with the with a list of the individual items that we said we were going to come back to and just ask if anyone is interested in working on specific ones to please let me know right. and then we'll make sure that they they all that somebody's looking at them ahead of next time because we do have a, a fair number of conditions where we we're saying we're going to come back to that we're going to come back to that and we're running out of time to do that so right. mr chairman yes sir can i just suggest as a technical thing that that on areas that are like bright red um that if we think if we've decided that 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 should be uh, uh, deleted, mm -hmm. that we do a sort of you know intentionally left blank there, and then not try to do anything with cross references until we get to the very end, so that all of those things only need to be done once. Sure. So with that, I think we're probably rather than going on to new findings, um, I think we're probably not going to leave it where we are now. So I'll ask Mr. Hanlon to introduce what he had uh, provided earlier this evening. Right. So Mr. Chairman, early, early on, just before this meeting, I distributed a uh, preliminary version of a draft amendment to the findings relating to transportation. Uh, the purpose of that was uh, to respond. I mean, that was a section that was already, I think, too cursory um, and not sufficiently explanatory of an, the analysis of the situation. And that was a matter of comment on from the public on several uh, from several people. Um, and it seemed to me that that as part of our, you know, the, the things we're doing here with the conditions are speaking to the applicant and speaking to regulators that are dealing with the applicant and they're trying to establish obligations and enforce them. When we get into the findings, we're going to be moving into a thing where we're speaking largely to the public. Uh, since this is subject to de novo review, our findings may have some impact on hack or the court but they won't, wouldn't be binding in any way. But at some point along the line, we have to explain or should be explaining to the public 
why it is that we're doing, if we adopt this decision, why it is we're going to do that. Um, and in some respects, uh, the, the findings we have are adequate for that, and in some respects, they're less adequate. It seemed to me that it would be advantageous for us to uh, look and to, to start by identifying general areas of, of local concern, um, two that we that are of local concern that we haven't mentioned have to do with the fact that housing itself is a local concern in Arlington, but also there's a lot of stuff about about the impact of construction that came up throughout the hearings that are not really addressed, uh, at least uh, directly in the in the fact findings of fact, although they are addressed in in various conditions. And it seemed to me that that by organizing it in terms of wetlands is a concern, flooding is a concern, transportation is a concern, neighborhood compatibility is a concern, that it provides us with an opportunity to state in the way to basically deal with the public where it is and say how it is we, we saw what it was that uh, that they were telling us and what the evidence was and why we decided to do things in the way in the way that we have. Uh, to a considerable extent, that just involves moving things around, but in transportation, it involved going back into the record and learning and saying a number of things that uh, so that we've probably many of us forgotten over the course of all of the time we've been looking at all of this. Um, so I wanted to just put, I, I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to look at the fairly extensive material in the transport in the transportation section because it would be sort of unfair to just drop it on you uh, all at once. And I can't just circulate these things between periods without raising at least some question about the open meeting law. So I have now taken the opportunity to introduce this in an open meeting and encourage you to look at it. I'll raise it when we get into the right part in the conditions. And I'm planning over the course of the next few days to go through and to try to, to put some, some meat on the bones of the general approach that I just described in, in a hope that we can, that I can provide some other things that are much simpler than this one uh, that enable us to sort of organize our findings in a way that make them more responsive to what the public has a right to expect of us. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Haverty, the, the document that, um, that Pat prepared, is that something that we should attach to the agenda for next time? Yeah, I think that makes sense to do that. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I will eventually next time, there are, you'll see that there are some blanks in the draft yep. that I sent around. Those will be filled in and there may be some minor things, but anyone who has read this version will not find it difficult to uh, find its way through whatever it is I can give to you next week. Okay, all right. So then we'll hold off on submitting it for posting until we have the, the revised version just to avoid confusion. Okay. Great. So anything further for this evening? Seeing none. All right, so thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Lanema for all their assistance for, in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at ACMI.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Or no, wait, we got to continue first. Bigger part. <laughs> <laughs> so close, so close. Um, so may I have a motion to continue uh, meeting for Thorndike Place to Tuesday, November 16th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Okay, vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. The chair votes aye. So we are continued now.
to Tuesday, November 16th uh, at 7.30 p.m. Now we can move, take a motion to adjourn. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so much. See you guys. Good night. Good night. Hi, guys. See you later, guys. See you later.